the flower petal ceremony, which was in this hospice house in San Francisco. This was a place where people went to spend their final moments. And so death was a near daily occurrence. Mm. And what, what Zen hospice did with it was to say, okay, obviously a sad and hard moment and all sorts of things, all sorts of adjectives for that moment. We set it up so that when the, the guys from the mortuary would come, They'd wheel the gurney and go get the body. And then on their way out, we'd stop in the garden or inside if it was raining. And volunteers would have gathered some flower petals together. And whoever was in the house, uh, staff, volunteers, uh, other family members, uh, friends, other residents sometimes, if they wanted to, there's no pressure, just would join in. And you could say a thing or two as you stood with the body, or some people would sing a song, or people would just weep or share a reflection or say nothing at all. And we'd hold a moment of silence, and then we would sprinkle the body with flower petals. Yeah. And then the funeral home guys would zip the bag up, and off they'd go. But like you say, it was this disruptive moment. First of all, it was the pause just to take all this in, which is otherwise just everyone's overwhelmed and there's just flux. But this is a big moment, so pausing by itself is powerful. But yeah. then sprinkling beauty into this moment and the physical realm, material beauty mm. around this body that is so clearly not filled with life anymore, but honoring what was and still is a piece of nature. And the final images of a body cloaked in flower petals versus the typical hospital or institutional death is profound. It's a very different vision. Yep. And so you can imagine it sets everybody up into their grief a little bit different. It welcomes grief in, in a way. There's a sweetness to the sorrow, not simply a trauma. I'm Ron Jor, and this is Remake, a podcast about design, systems, and society. In each episode, I talk to someone who's trying to change our lives for the better in some meaningful way, whether through a new product, new venture, or a new way of looking at the world. And I try to understand how they came to it, what makes them tick, and what we can learn from them. B.J. Miller is an American physician, author, and speaker. He's a practicing hospice and palliative medicine physician, and he's best known for his 2015 TED Talk, what really matters at the end of life. BJ, who served as an executive director of San Francisco's Zen Hospice Project, has been on the teaching faculty at UCSF School of Medicine since 2017, and is the subject of the Netflix Academy Award-nominated short documentary, Endgame. His book, A Beginner's Guide to the End, which he co-authored with Shoshana Berger, is an unflinching, compassionate, and intensely pragmatic guide to the end of life. Today, BJ sees patients and caregivers through his online palliative care service, Metal Health. It's been a rare pleasure to talk to someone like BJ, who is someone who steps into realms of experience most of us avoid at all costs. And to hear the precious types of wisdom he brings with him from there. This episode, I think, is also a great introduction to the world of palliative medicine, which may be the first time the medical establishment put the patient's experience, quality of life, and constructed meeting at the heart of care, treating people as opposed to diseases. BG and I discuss the ways the healthcare system and hospital system is badly designed and what can be done about it. This conversation is one of a series of great conversations we have lined up for you in the next few weeks with people who are reimagining and redesigning our world, including designers, psychologists, technologists, social scientists, and even physicists. To hear these conversations, you can tune in by heading over to remakepod.org and following us on your favorite podcast player. And now let's jump right in with BJ Miller. All right. I'm sitting here with BJ Miller. BJ, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Iran. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, so as we usually start these days, we start with an inquiry about COVID, how it affected your life over the past year and a half, two years, and how it affected your work and your life. That's an ongoing question, isn't it? I keep thinking that it may be we may be reaching the end, et cetera, but boy, clearly we've got a little ways to go. So it's an ongoing thing. And just like any other good old existential crisis, I have found it 
discombobulating, sometimes subtly, sometimes obviously, actually mostly subtly. Sonia, my partner and I had been, we were going to create an online palliative care program of some sort anyway, that we were already heading in that direction. So COVID forced our work into a strictly online endeavor, which was fine. We were in a way heading that way anyway. And in the rest of my life, so much of my life has to do with work. And when not at work, I like to be in the woods. So in some ways, there were macro changes on my life. In public speaking and things like that, I used to do a lot more of. That has gone away, at least for now. So there's some changes. Mm. But then the more interesting part of your question is just personally how it's quietly just loose, shaken me down, just like everybody. All the systems that we participate in and take for granted, all our sort of daily rhythms are all just a little bit or otherwise jacked, Mm. and you can feel it. And so I feel a little wayward, a little less hopeful at times. I just watch my mood smolder and feel a little less bound to this planet and all that kind of good stuff when the ground shakes underneath us. Yeah. That's and that's still going. I notice that daily. Yeah. Yeah, It's definitely something that everybody knows from their personal experience. And that's one positive thing that we have with Mm -hmm. COVID is this shared global experience that everybody can connect with and everybody Mm -hmm. understands, even though it's very different in different places, but there's some aspects that are the same. Yes. This is the part that actually gets me excited. I found that for me that there was also this a little bit of unraveling at first where everything was hitting, but after a while it got very comfortable. You get into Mm -hmm. your paces and I just started cooking at home and going for a walk in the woods around the house or in the park. Mm-hmm. and uh, not seeing anybody and it, it almost becomes too comfortable like then you have to shake yourself up mm-hmm. when you can mm-hmm. see people right on yeah yeah i've found social situations i've been in a few social situations i'm just awkward i really don't know how to handle company in the same way it's just funny which i actually enjoy i like how it shakes our these sort of very basic things and makes us look at them with fresh eyes and anyway there's some there's a fair amount to actually in, to like about that or at least appreciate So to start the conversation, we we have this opening question that we found works to get to know the person a little bit. And it is, what's something you learned early in life, maybe in childhood, but anyway, early, that still drives Mm -hmm. you today, that's still with you Mm -hmm. and still active in your life today? Let's see here. The thing that leapt to mind first is this basic feeling of connection, an unseen connection, this feeling connected to plants, animals, humans, just the world that we all are. And it's not something we can always see, but it's something that's always there. I think I've had that since as long as I can recall. It was one of my earlier thoughts as a young man whose mind was starting to open up. It was something of a sort of I don't know if I would have called it spiritual back then, but that's how I understand spirituality now is this sort of unseen connections that require some leap of faith. But if you can feel them, there's proof of them, you can't necessarily point to them, but you can feel them. And I don't know, call that spirituality or anything else, but that was an early sort of a felt like a breakthrough thought. It was a beautiful thought and one that rang true and just sort of stuck with me. My parents made a half-assed attempt to get me into church, Episcopalian church, generally speaking. Mm. So I had early days where I was enamored with some of the messages I heard in church through song, love, and forgiveness. But the golden rule in particular, really, this do unto others idea. And that seemed to be the sort of more practical side of this feeling connected to everything. So one way or another, those thoughts have stuck with me. Yeah, more of a feeling, like I say. Yeah. Is there a specific moment or event that makes you think where this started, where this actually happened inside of your childhood? I remember it came out in a couple of different ways. One was in the negative lens. So my mother had polio and mm-hmm. uses a wheelchair for almost all of my life. She's had post-polio syndrome and progressive disability from that and has either walked with crutches and a brace or most of the time using a wheelchair. I just remember as a young person being very close with my mom and watching how the world treated her very often pretty poorly. Even when they thought they were being kind, it was always very often pity driven or Mm. someone trying to play the hero or all sorts of weird projections, sometimes downright rude, but all over the place and oftentimes not very pleasant and oftentimes missing the mark. 
And so I, I remember as a kid feeling like the feeling of people missing the mark registering, like on some level, I knew my mother, I knew mm. she was a human being just like everybody else. And so I had this sort of conclusion. I, I could work backwards from that. I knew she belonged. I knew she was part of this world. And then I'd watch humans crowd her out as we do with our built environment and our structures and the things that we invent that accidentally or otherwise leave people out. And I watched that play out and I mm. always felt sad and deeply unfair, but it was also energizing for me in that I feel like I felt as a young kid, I knew, at least on this note, I was confused very often, but at least I felt like I knew something others weren't paying attention to. Mm. Like I could tell they were missing the mark. It wasn't on my mom. It was on them. Yeah. So that, that in a negative frame made the, and then in a positive frame, I remember a morning, I don't know if it was a morning, it was a day, it was sunny out. And we were living at this point in El Paso, Texas. And I was, we moved around a lot and I was in, hanging out in the backyard just playing. And I just remember having this thought, I must've had a dream the night before. And I was thinking about the dream and I was playing, looking up in the sky and just reveling in the grass. I would have been maybe uh, six something like that. Mm. And I just remember this thought like, gosh, if I, the dream I had last night, which apparently what quote unquote wasn't real, sir seemed real. And there were people moving around in it and doing things. And I remember what the dream was, but it was what's the stop me from th believing that I right now I'm in a character in somebody else's dream. And it struck me. I remember it was a profound moment for a young m m mind. For me, it was anyway, it felt like, whoa, like I cut through some things and saw a perspective tweak that opened a lot of stuff up and felt beautiful. And then it allowed me to see life as this kind of mysterious, creative, wild thing that no one mm. understands on some level. And that was a, that was a positive, it was a beautiful feeling. And that stuck with me. I remember that very clearly. Yeah. That reminds me of, I forgot the name of the person in the, parable, but this is from a, an ancient Tao story about a man who dreams that he's a butterfly. And then he's asking himself, wait, maybe I'm a butterfly who dreams that, that I'm a man who's dreaming that I'm a butterfly. <laughs> it's an ancient Tao right tale on. from the Zhuangzi, I think. Mm. So I mm. studied religious studies and, and especially Buddhist philosophy in my master's. Mm. And this view of spirituality where everything is connected, or as I guess, as Buddhism would say it, that the separation is an illusion is well known and, and very impactful. And so, yes. so I listened to your TED talk and in your TED talk, you talk about another big moment, the, the moment of your accident that must have added another tier to the self evolution. Do you want to talk about that mm -hmm. a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it was 19, a sophomore year of college and I was screwing around with some friends. I had a, on a commuter train, which is a parked commuter train. And I had a metal watch on my wrist and I got close enough to the power source and electricity art. And that was that. So I ended up coming pretty darn close to death and losing one arm below the elbow and two legs below the knees. So that was what I was just convention, a big old shakeup that changed me in some ways and reaffirmed some older threads in me in some ways and did all sorts of things for me, to me. Yeah. The first instinct is to say, I can't imagine something like that happened. But the truth is, I think I've imagined things like this my whole life. And I think it's deeply tied to identity and how you think of yourself. And so I was imagining having an accident. I said, I've never been an athlete. Like I'm an intellectual guy. Like I'll probably reshape my identity around that. And, and, and it wouldn't. how do you engage with identity during that? period, because it seems mm -hmm. like the biggest crisis is one of identity at that point. Is that be a fair description? Yeah, I think that is a good and fair way to put it. You can trace a lot of things back to that notion. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll roll with you on that. That does feel right. There, you're distracted by all sorts of physical sensations, of course, that you're dealing with that get your sort of top of mind. But all those cue you back to your question about who, who the hell am I? Why is this happening? Mm -hmm. What should I do about it? I'm trying to make sense of it, trying to make sense of yourself within it, et cetera. So yeah, yeah, this identity issue does register, absolutely. And for me at the time, 19, your identity is also, or I think many people's identity is inherently in flux mm -hmm. or perhaps it's deepening or something's unfurling. And this is a pretty rich time in the developing person's mind uh, and being. And for me, I had always felt a little... 
lost in the world of humans. Because as I mentioned earlier, I think I was a sort of a sensitive kid and watching how the world treated my mother, reified that, confirmed that. This sense of feeling connected. I felt connected, but then I'd watch people step all over the connection casually, just, just not distinguishing themselves, separating, feeling themselves, holding themselves as separate. And, and I had some sense that we weren't. Mm. I wouldn't have articulated it very well, but I could feel this distinct, this problem in me where I felt connected to all these humans, but humans didn't seem to be acting very connected. Yeah. And it confused the hell out of me. So that was in the backdrop for me always. And, and at that point, so I was always feeling a little bit wayward, a little bit lost, a little bit melancholy. And then sometimes I'd snap into these moments of connection with people where it would all kind of work and I'd feel elated. And But if you ask me who I had signed up, I had I was explicitly taking this on as an undergraduate at a liberal arts. I was taking advantage of being at a liberal. I was taking it seriously. I was going there to learn things, have new thoughts and experiences that would help shape me. I was looking to be shaped on some level. And I may have answered, I, I think one of the things that happened around that time, and I've come to see it now as a sort of a mixture, but at the time I may have thought more like that identity was this thing that you discover that exists and you just got to go find it. Like much like meaning of any kind. Meaning exists and our, our role is to go uncover it somewhere. Who I am at my core is a thing that exists and I need to go f discover it. And I still, and I think there's a song in response on this, but I, at that time, what really became much clearer to me was that a lot of identity, a lot of who anybody is made up, you, you construct it through experiences, through what you're bouncing off against. And you get sculpted by your life as it unfolds on some level too. Mm. And that was actually really key because if I could acknowledge this, this sense of self as being this made up thing, it took me, it's still a work in progress, but then it allowed me to start thinking of being in as a creative endeavor. I'm not an, I don't make art. I don't think of, I'm not a classically creative person. You wouldn't look at my CV or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But I think around then I, I know that I absorb this notion or this sense that we are creative inherently yeah. of just getting through the day, making ourselves up, et cetera. So that was a big moment where I started to move towards this idea, of a more playful thing that life is this raw material and we make stuff from it. Mm. And that is not preordained. And that is a work in progress ever. And I love that notion. I was very happy to find my way to that thought. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame that this is something that's not taught more explicitly. I mean, it is in Buddhist countries, but not so mm -hmm. much in, in the West. It's quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. But I want to go back to a point that you made about connection for a second. It, it just it reminds me of uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates and Between the World and Me, where he kept referring to the people who think they're white. Mm -hmm. As in, <laughs> I know that we're all the same, but there are these mm -hmm. people over there who think they're white and mm -hmm. I'm not. Does that resonate? Is that similar to what you were feeling in a way? Yeah, sure. In a way, yes. It's more artfully put and very evocatively put. But yeah, I, that's right. And I think this sort of misplaced meaning or misplaced identity markers cause a lot of trouble mm. for everybody involved. But I, yeah, I definitely appreciate that statement. That does feel accurate to me. So we're going to talk about palliative care and what you do today, but it feels like some of that transition started even in that unit after the accident mm -hmm. where you talk about the snowball. Do you want to tell us a story? Because it, it, to me, that felt so connected. Yeah. And it's funny, I, it, it's only much later in life that experience has registered as so significant. At the time, it was significant. But so what happened was, and I misspoke in my TED Talk, it was a lot of these memories of being in the hospital were pretty blurry. But it was my friend Pete who smuggled in this snowball. The burn unit around is a very, inherently, it needs to be a very sterile place. By design, it's meant to keep nature at bay. It is not a naturally natural place place. Right. You would never confuse a burn unit with a, something you stumbled in in the woods. And so infection is really what kills a lot of people in burns. So the place is incredibly sterile. Everyone's gowned up, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Especially in the early days, you couldn't have more than one person in your room at a time. There's no windows. You're in a sealed space, blah, blah, blah. So that was a sort of backdrop. And I was, it was November that I was injured, end of November. And this is in New Jersey. And so winter came and you're, you're sitting in this bed strapped to all this machinery. You're not moving an inch. 
Mm. And you're vacillating between pretty horrifying pain and extreme boredom. Sitting there, I felt it was hard to feel connected to just about anything but machines. And my friends from school would come visit. And one day, Pete, one of maybe the first or one of the first snowfalls of the winter, but Pete smuggled in a snowball into the burning, which is not easy to do because it would have melted pretty quickly. And somehow he got it into the room and I got to hold it. He gave it to me and put it in my hand. As he's a beautiful, thoughtful guy, I think he just was trying to bring the outside in. I don't think he was trying to do anything holy, but it felt pretty holy mm. touching this piece of nature in my hand. So what, one was just having access to nature, again, was pretty powerful to feel that connection mm. and to realize we, we are nature. And then the other was just watching this thing disappear in front of me. The snowball was dying as you're watching it melt. I could feel the coldness on my skin, which was scintillating. My skin was so hyper uh, sensitive. And so hot and still. So feeling the coldness and then watching this snowball melt go away, dying, right? But it's not going away entirely. It's becoming water. You start seeing how death or endpoints are themselves made up. They're you know, sort of mental. We dog ear this moment and we call it a death. But really, if you step back, it's just a change. It's, it's really all you can say. Yeah. And that snowball went away and I was left with the puddle. And, but anyway. I was just feeling this movement of time and how everything given enough time is okay and how much command we have over our experience by naming it well, by seeing it a little bit longer and seeing it through. Mm. And so it felt like it was an aesthetic euphoria. It put me in touch with my senses in a way because anything pleasurable at that point, your body is not, it's just a tube of pain mm. for months. And so feeling anything, any relief was powerful. Feeling anything was powerful. The metaphor was powerful and useful. It was just a really, I could go on and on about it. It was just a powerful, simple, super simple yeah. moment. I mean, it was all right there. Yeah. And it's a moment that the system that was designed to keep you alive wasn't designed to provide. Yeah. And I want to know, because I happen to know what palliative care is because I dated a surgeon mm -hmm. who was really interested in this area and I <laughs> knew I was interested in spirituality. So I heard a lot about mm -hmm. this, but I don't mm -hmm. think most people still know what that is. So do you, you want to maybe give us yeah. a little intro? What is it? Why do we need it? Yeah. Th yeah. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. There's a public service announcement moment in this. People don't know what palliative care is, and that's a problem. Uh, we can talk about why that's a problem. But basically, palliative care, and if you looked up the definition, Medicare defines it one way, World Health Organization, they're all a couple paragraphs long. Conceptually, it's different from the rest of healthcare in some important ways. But it's basically that it's framed within the context of serious illness. That palliative care is a medical subspecialty, an interdisciplinary subspecialty that's devoted to quality of life and the mitigation of suffering. It, that's about as succinct as I can put it. So another way of saying that is an, a palliative care clinician or team would be focusing on your experience of illness, would be focusing on if we have a problem that we're trying to fix, it's suffering, not a disease. So that just right out of the shoots, mm. it kicks us into the subjective realm. And I can't test for suffering. My patients have to help me understand that. Suffering is a universal experience mm. and highly individual. So anyway, so the answer to your question, that is it. The interdisciplinary pursuit of quality of life and the mitigation of suffering. Yeah. Yeah. And you said that you serve as a reflective advocate as much as a prescribing physician. And so right. what is that process look like when you work with a patient? It's it's not about dictating, right? It's not about prescribing. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Sometimes the work, especially as a physician on the medical side, a lot of the work as a palliative care doctor does include a prescription pad often treating the common sort of modes of suffering in within illness, symptoms, basically pain, nausea, fatigue, etc. So a lot of the work can be doled out through a prescription pad, but that's just a piece of the puzzle. That's just really trying to turn down the noise for a person so they can be something besides their illness for a moment. And the rest of the job is much more spiritual or existential in nature, relational in nature. Some folks, we love to talk about patient-centered care to remind ourselves that the healthcare system was really designed for diseases, not people. You feel that all over the place. It's good to name it. But another way of putting it is really perhaps a refined way of putting it would be that it's really relationship-centered care. 
but it really is about the dynamic between two human beings. So when I go in to meet with a patient and family, yes, I'm going in as a palliative care physician. That's my excuse for being there in a way. That's the ticket to get to this person in a very intimate moment. Mm. But the rest of it from there is, is really taking off the white coat and being a fellow human being in, in knowing how, in my own experience, how we, like we were saying earlier, how we make ourselves up. But we do that by all sorts of relationships. We are sculpted by relationships. We exist because of relationships, whether it's to people or things or animals. That's how human experience unfolds. Mm. And so there, then I'm stepping into a dynamic where my job is to be that fellow human being relating. Oftentimes that may be bearing witness, just listening and making sure someone's story is seen and heard and felt, and they know that they exist because someone is seeing them. Mm. And someone is seeing them with non-judgmental open eyes and on some level accepting them. Judgment, projection, these are the perils. These would be the pitfalls in my trade. Really, it's my job to be there for them as they begin to see themselves in these new circumstances. As they begin to feel safe because someone isn't running away. Maybe even someone is loving them. And then they start feeling comfortable in the world again, maybe for a minute. And maybe they can start carving out from there since, hey, I want to be on this planet now. And then maybe from there, they can start having hopes and dreams again for whatever time they have left. And in this way, you're unfurling with a human being, oftentimes simply as a witness. Rarely am I telling someone what to do. Sometimes I'll nudge or suggest or provoke so that we can find our way. Yeah. But it's really my job is to help catalyze an experience in someone else and not to dictate it, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. One way that I was thinking about it is the, the traditional healthcare seems to treat people the same. It's almost like a factory for curing disease and, and it's all about efficiency mm -hmm. and rightly so in some ways. And what you do is treat each person as an individual first with their own mm -hmm. values, their own priorities that might be different from that of the healthcare system entirely. Exactly, and, yes. And the person might choose to not go through chemo, right? The person might choose to take a risk, take a thoughtful risk mm -hmm. for quality of life. And it mm -hmm. almost feels like you are this, and I don't know if this is a, a fair description, but almost like an interface, like a human, uh, yeah. we design interfaces. So almost like a, a layer mm -hmm. of interface with the person. And, and you can talk to both the hard healthcare system and the soft human person. Mm -hmm. Right on. Yeah, that is very well put. Yeah, to, to get to what you just said, you have to realize as a clinician, <clears throat> one thing I think that uh, a lot of us doctors sometimes blow past this, which is to say that, like you're saying, an individual, the way they see the world, the way they see themselves in the world, may or may not jive with the way the medical system is seeing them. Mm. I think because medicine comes from this attempt at objectivity and is looking for sort of where at the physiologic level, how we as human bodies act in the world, there are some patterns to recognize. There are laws of science that govern our bodies. That is true. But how we interpret those and what we do with those and what other ways we develop besides the physiologic, that's wide open. So part of the trick oftentimes is realizing that the medical lens is also just one lens. It's not the whole thing. I think medicine confuses itself with it's a convention, a way of understanding reality that confuses itself with reality. And that I, it's a variation on a theme that a lot of a mistake a lot of industries and a lot of people make, mm. which is to confuse the construct with the thing itself, with the thing it's trying to help represent or understand, mm. in this case, life, that life is not simply, we're not simply medical critters. And so the really key thing is to name this as a medicine person. I love medicine. I just, I get upset when we oversell it as the truth. That alone, giving patients and families, naming that sometimes explicitly or otherwise, and helping them see that they're not some foreigner in this strange land. I always have to you know, help them realize, no, you're still on earth. We're the weird ones. The medical world is a strange one. You get to still be you. And I sometimes I'm just involved in evincing a person's personality, mm. a persona out, which has been homogenized out of them through the medical mm. mill. That's yeah. a powerful statement. And you mm. said, nowhere are the effects of bad design more heartbreaking or the opportunities of good design more compelling than at the end of life. And you talk mm. about hospitals and the healthcare system as badly designed. Those are all 
pretty strong statements. And I know you you also believe in medicine and you also believe in the in the essential mm-hmm. role that they play. But mm-hmm. I'm a designer. Many of the listeners are designers. Uh, how is the healthcare system badly designed? And if there were designers and design thinkers out there who wanted to contribute, where could they start? Let's see here. So let's explore that first part. A big one is that the design is so compelling. The industry is so humongous that it's eclipsed the sun. It's It has stopped to realize that it's a convention. It's a way of seeing, not the way of seeing. So right out of the shoots, that's a big issue. When anyone or any one thing or any way conflates itself with the way, then trouble starts. Mm-hmm. Up. So that's a big one. Another big one would be that 120 years ago or so, or depends, industrial revolution, technology revolution, mid 19th century, scientific method, objectification, reproducibility of results led to a certain way, uh, a certain scientific method. That's where medicine and science really got in bed Mm. together. And a lot of amazing things that that we would call anything that we don't like a problem and then we would solve that problem, set about solving that problem. And it's, it's, it's worked in a lot of ways, pretty stunning. Medicine is profoundly powerful, but it has some problems. One big thing here is this sort of reductive lens that it squeezes all human experience through physiology and anatomy, Mm. through what we understand of science. So any scientist would have to tell you there's all sorts of things we don't understand. But in the medical world, that stuff is not in the room. You crowd that out. We call that ignorance. And so we over-defend our positions sometimes. And that causes some heartache. And it's just painful to see the majesty of existence rammed through, extruded through this medical lens. If it acknowledged what gets crowded out of that math, if it acknowledged its limitations more, I think that would take some pressure off us as clinicians and it would improve our relationship with the public we're trying to serve. And it would open us up towards other ways of seeing other ways of being. And then clinicians get to be in partnership with their patients, exploring, like we're talking about, exploring how to be, how they want to be, what sense to make of their experiences, what they can and can't control. Medicine over-focuses on the parts we can control and bastardizes the uncontrollable parts. Those Mm. are things that ruin your results. Mm. We don't like those things. So... Anyway, those are some ways the system is poorly designed. Yeah. Yeah. You talk about necessary versus unnecessary suffering. And I'm wondering if you can give me some examples of unnecessary suffering and then how it can be transmuted maybe to a place where then obviously you can't do much about the underlying conditions if they're severe enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So picking up on your last question, bridging here. So like medicine has so seduced itself and sold itself to the public as this fixing this thing that illness is a problem, like we mentioned a moment ago, and we're going to fix it. Mm. And when a problem is fixable, or if you want it fixed, that's great. The trouble is there's all sorts of things we can't fix. And in medicine, that's an abandonment moment. That's where medicine gets less interested in you as a patient on some level. Mm. So chronic illness, unfixable situations, death, these on some level, psychically or explicitly, register as failures. So if illness, death, from everything we can tell, they seem to be pretty necessary. They keep coming around. Mm. We've beaten back the clock on some level, but death is at this point still inevitable. Mm. Illness is still very normal. That's what happens to a body. So we, if we start demonizing and pathologizing those natural states, then at some point we're opening up a type of suffering. We're at war with our reality then. Mm. And in some ways, we're worth more with ourselves. So if illness and death are you know, examples of potentially necessary suffering, suffering that just come in your way, it's like weather. A storm can come and just take your house. And that's not nature being mean. That's just nature being nature. Mm. And similarly, someday it just takes our body. We just go and off the planet for you and our body goes on to be something else. I don't think of it as mean, but anyway... If that's the necessary stuff, the unnecessary things are how we then, like we've been describing, accidentally vilify and demonize this part of reality. Mm. And like I said, then we're pointing the gun at ourselves on some level. To go to war with one's cancer, while it makes some sense as a trick, it comes at a cost because those cancer cells are your cells. Those are in your body. They come from you. You are going to war with your own body on some level. Mm. And if you don't name that, If you're not really careful about doing that thoughtfully, 
then you accidentally open up all this unnecessary suffering, this stuff, this made up stuff, like being at war with oneself when your body's just doing what a body does and it's not in your control. Misapplying the sense of control where we really don't have it is another way of, mm. then we just feel like failures on top of it all. And all the effort we go to keep certain parts of reality at bay, we end up biting us in the ass one way and another. And those are the unnecessary bits. That's yeah. this human making new shit up, new ways to hurt. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. So the first words in your book is there's nothing wrong with dying. There's nothing wrong with you for dying. Yeah, yeah there's nothing wrong with you for dying, but also... Death is not an unusual thing. It's not a failure. It's not a problem. Everybody goes through it. It's fundamentally a part of life. And dying differently from, I guess, our culture and, and most people in our culture, not that it's not hard, but it, it also it has an opportunity for growth, for meaning, for connection, for beauty even. Mm -hmm. And tell me how you've come to see dying and death in this way. And what can we mm -hmm. learn about this process of dying, which we'll all mm -hmm. go through? There's a lot, I think, that dying or death can teach us. My favorite thing is how everything has got to go. It is the most egalitarian force mm -hmm. around. It doesn't judge you. It will take all of you, not just the good parts, not just the bad parts. It's not picking and choosing. It is equal access under the laws of nature. And there's something really powerful about that. I feel like, therefore, it provides us this shared bookend, this shared basic experience that does, in fact, make it true that you and I and anybody else on this planet who has ever lived have a lot in common and are connected if only by that force, by death alone. I don't think that's the only thing that connects us. So one big lesson there is for us to be as big as death and to accept everything around us inside and outside of us. So all of the parts of us, not just the good ones, not picking and choosing stuff. It demands a bigger kind of love. And it's not always comfortable, but it is an expansive force in this way. Even as your body's shriveling down, your sense of connection, your sense of self, your sense of life in general that can get bigger. Yeah. This can death can kind of pry us open. Yeah. So that's one big lesson that death affords. Maybe there's a couple of different lessons in there. But I think one of the things that you asked about how your audience, other designers can apply themselves here. Another way of coming at this, and I think I mentioned this in the TED Talk too, which is as designers, you need limits. You know, try being an architect without limits of the laws of material sciences or laws of nature, or whatever it is. You need something to bounce off of. You need something to pull against and to push into. Right. And there's a dynamic tension required. There is no blank sheet of paper, actually. And thank God, what the hell would we do with that? Well, there, there's a paper, but it has an end. It's a very specific shape. Yes, it has, it has a beginning and an end. And if you start, and you can pretty quickly start populating that paper with things that you can't change that are just facts that you have to work with. So when we as humans bump up against certain things that are bigger than ourselves, that are beyond our control, things that we can't change. And for me, one of the things I've learned, I've loved this statement is like, I love to change things, but when I can't change things, I know it's on me to love that thing. Mm. That's the best thing I can do. If I can't change something, I need to love it. It doesn't necessarily mean like it, but I need to understand that my love of life includes this thing too. And so this is where humans get really creative. Like I said in, the, in that talk, you could say, what a pain in the ass. We've got to eat food. We've got to go get fine food just to live. What an annoyance. Yeah, it's a pain in the ass, right? Especially if we were hunter-gatherers. There's a lot of work going into getting our food, right? Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to eat? I could just lounge around. You yeah. can see the need to eat is a problem. But as humans, we've found our way to reconcile, okay, fact of nature, part of the deal. Now let's get creative. Let's get inventive. Let's get playful. Look what we've done with food as a species. Jesus, it's amazing. Or the need for shelter, this thing that we just need. Look what we've done with that in architecture. I have a friend who rails against sleep. He just, he's so mad that we have to lose half of our life to sleep. <laughs> so I, I feel like it, it has something to do maybe with left brain, right brain kind of duality where there's a tendency in the left hemisphere to see things in this very practical way. And so if I didn't have to sleep, mm -hmm. I would gain this many hours. So I would be more productive. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. the right brain is just says, mm, sleep is delicious. Like it's, it's more animalistic, maybe. And it feels like also this dichotomy of healthcare between the very rigid problem solving mindset and, and, and a broader, mm -hmm. softer, more human way of seeing things. 
you, you, and ideally there's an interplay between those. So you don't need to choose one of those paths. That's a beautiful swirl that can happen simultaneously and together. And that's when things are really clicking. You get both. Yeah, that's why we need both perspectives. So you said that what the dying need is comfort, existential peace, and a sense of wonderment or spirituality. And this wonderment, something I'm very curious about, and it's infused, I think, also in the Netflix movie Endgame and in your book and in your work, it is, I can't quite put my finger on it, but giving people a new perspective, a more expansive perspective, mm-hmm. a moment of seeing through the boundaries that are pressing them. Can you talk about that mm-hmm. a little bit? Yeah. It reminds me of something you said earlier in our conversation. Another way of seeing this sort of medicine is that we can know so much about our chemistry, our molecules, or the molecular makeup. But we can spend so much time focusing on that stuff that we accidentally crowd out the things that make us interested in being alive in the first place. So in other words, you may meet a doctor who knows more about your molecules than you do, but you may know a lot more about why you're why it's amazing to have molecules in the first place. With all our knowledge, we crowd out the amazement. It's just stunning that you and I are having this conversation. We're in the same place at the same time on the same planet talking with each other. What the fuck are the odds of that? Excuse me. It's just the whole thing is insane. Yeah. It's just wild. And you look up in the night sky and we're one of a zillion. It's just, if that gets crowded out, that very basic accessible wildness of all this, Mm. then we've really lost something. We've lost the inspiration. So you may prescribe, if you're my doc, you may have all the prescriptions, all the meds to help me keep going. But if you've crowded out my inspiration to keep going, then we've, we're done. We're toast. You have to find a way to that intrigue. And that gets lost oftentimes in modern life and certainly within the healthcare system. I think when we're talking about Wonderman, one of the things that appealed to me so you, you described this ritual at the Zen Hospice Project. Mm-hmm. When somebody dies, you describe the simple ritual that they have that I feel does just disrupt the standard default way of framing death. Maybe you could describe it. Yeah. So Zen Hospice Project, what a cool place that was. I worked there for five years. I don't know who, who created this ritual, but it was around by the time I got there. And it's probably way older and bigger than the Zen Hustles Project. But basically the idea was, we called it the flower petal ceremony, which was, so in this hospice house in San Francisco, this six bedroom little Victorian, this was a place where people went to spend their final moments. And so death was a near daily occurrence. Mm. In the way this organization made, what we did with it, what, what Zen Hospice did with it was to say, okay, obviously a sad and hard moment and all sorts of things, all sorts of adjectives for that moment. But then the sort of necessary logistics of the funeral home coming to retrieve the body and take it away and, uh, and close this chapter of a person's life. We set it up so that when the, the guys from the mortuary would come, they'd wheel the gurney and go get the body. And then on their way out, we'd stop in the garden or inside if it was raining, and volunteers would have gathered some flower petals together. And whoever was in the house, staff, volunteers, other family members, uh, friends, other residents sometimes, if they wanted to, there's no pressure, just would join in and you could say a thing or two as you stood with the body, or some people would sing a song, or people would just weep or share a reflection or say nothing at all. And we'd hold a moment of silence and then we would sprinkle the body with flower petals. And then the funeral home guys would zip the bag up and off they'd go. But like you said, it was this disruptive moment. First of all, it was the pause just to take all this in, which is otherwise just everyone's overwhelmed and there's just flux. But this is a big moment. So pausing by itself is powerful. But then sprinkling beauty into this moment and the physical realm, material beauty Mm. around this body that is so clearly not filled with life anymore, but honoring what was and still is a piece of nature. And the final images of a body cloaked in flower petals versus the typical hospital or institutional death is profound. It's a very different vision. And so you can imagine it sets everybody up into their grief a little bit different. It welcomes grief in, in a way. There's a sweetness to the sorrow, not simply a trauma. Yeah, and again, this thing that I'm trying to put my finger on, because it's almost a design principle. You also said Mm -hmm. in hospice, one of the most tried and true interventions is baking cookies. You talked about making life more wonderful, not just less horrible. 
Mm -hmm. So is this the principle of there's a joy to be found in these moments? You can disrupt the pressure mm -hmm. from the system and from society mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. gloomy or to disappear. There's some sense of defiance in that, of doing the delightful things. Yes, there is. The palliative care is really trying to disrupt these flows. And in some ways, palliative care, when I'm part of, it shouldn't need to exist. Why do we need a subspecialty to remind us that we are connected, to remind us that how we feel is important, mm. to not run away from naturally occurring things like death? The truth is, if we were all super mature humans living in a super mature society, we wouldn't need a specialty to come along to make the case. It's because the healthcare system has swept away so much of the good stuff and has taken us down this chute that we have to have this other force come in and remind us and yank us towards these other things that otherwise get lost. Mm. So it is disruptive. It is even a little revolutionary within the confines of healthcare. Mm. And in this way, in the spirit, especially early on when I was joining this field, there was a real spirit of uh, a countercultural kind of coyotes, like tricksters, kind of playing with these conventions for therapeutic purposes, but getting bold and disruptive. Yeah. yeah. So trying to get at the root of that, it is, you might say that simply just the act of not running away from hard moments. Mm. Just if you stick around and bring your whole self as a creative human being to any old picture you're sitting in front of, including a dead body, yeah. if you let yourself be there, well, then other cool thoughts and feelings come with the package because you're there as a human being. Yeah. And so it's an act of not running away and letting ourselves and seeing the made up thing that is human perspective or the malleable thing that is human perspective, how we can frame things, how we can change things by the way we see them. Mm. If you bring that to the mix, just that, not running away and that sort of creative perspective work, that's 90% of the game. That's so much of what it is. And then from there, it's just... Let's see where we go. I'm present with you in real time. Let's see where we go. Mm -hmm. And then it's a curiosity, and then it's playful, and then it's beautiful, horribly sad, painful, it's many things. But I, you get to stick around with a lot more. If you're not trying to crowd out hard stuff in life, well, then you get to be present for a lot more life. Yeah. In your book, which you wrote with Shoshana Berger, first of all, I love the title, A Beginner's Guide to the End, Practical Advice mm. for Living Life and Facing Death. And I love this title because it also captures the spirit of the book. It, it is at, at the same time profound and deals with topics that are very taboo and extremely dry and practical at, at times in a way that <laughs> makes me laugh almost. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, the first words are, there's nothing wrong with dying. And you make a point there, next to birth, death is one of the most profound experiences. Shouldn't we talk about it, prepare for it? use what it can teach us about how to live. And so what led to writing this book? I'd love to hear the story of how it came about and what were your thoughts as you were crafting it? Working as a palliative care doc, pretty quickly you get a sense of a lot of the ways that we suffer unnecessarily. We talked about unnecessary suffering earlier, but just from a lack of basic information, for example, how to navigate the healthcare system, what's the to-do list around death, how to get services that you need. These are all very practical issues that, that the answers are hard to find. And a lot of people end up squandering precious time looking for them right. or one way or another suffering in ways they don't need to. So it was very obvious that the modern world, the modern society for a number of reasons had moved away from death and could use a very basic compendium of information in one place to raise the floor a little bit, not to blow out the ceiling so much, but to raise the floor on which we're all standing. So that was, I knew that. I, I don't think of myself as a writer at all. And I didn't know that I would be getting to write that book. But then I found my way to IDEO through mm -hmm. a funny experience. I got in the building talking about prosthetic shoes, but then in the conversation there, around the therapeutic nature of aesthetics, of the felt experience of life. We captured some minds and entered a conversation with David Webster and a bunch of other folks at IDEO. Over time, we started talking about death, my day job at the time. And that, that just led to all these flowering conversations. And I kept finding myself in the building at IDEO. I loved those guys. And it was to see a discipline outside of healthcare taking up these issues. It's still 
I get very excited about that potential. Mm. And palliative care is a philosophy, not just a clinical discipline. I think what you're doing here, Iran, is a kind of palliative care. So anyway, I got to know folks at IDEO, including Shoshana Berger, and then at Zen Hospice, we hired them to help us with some branding issues. But all through that whole process, I just got to know a lot of people there and love them, including Shoshana. And I think it was her idea about writing this book together. And it was a pretty quick yes, because like I said, I knew there was a need. I also knew it shouldn't come from just a clinician. We needed someone inside of healthcare and someone out to to do it justice Mm -hmm. and to make it more accessible. So Shoshana and I partnered up and away we went. We wrote the book together. It took about three years. We each wrote about half the book and then we cross edited to smooth out our sort of singular voice. It's wonderful. Just to give people a taste, you talk about what your goals should be and you say, answer questions such as, what's most important to you now? What can you live without? How much treatment do you want and what kind? Where do you want to be when you die? And how do you hope to be remembered? And you deal with forgiveness. You deal with a cleaning up. You say cleaning up is one of the best gifts you can give a loved one. So there's these very emotional, meaning-laden very Mm -hmm. human topics. And then on the other side, there's these just super practical chapters, like what to put into your when I die file, the costs and insurance and how to deal with insurance at the end of life. And even this very practical, it's moving, but it's very practical to the day of you hearing the bad news. And it's so rich with knowledge and experience. And it's wonderfully practical. I can see myself Mm -hmm hopefully in a long time from now, but being in a situation like this and saying, you know what, that book has some very practical answers. <laughs> so what was the reception like? Yeah, we were excited to get, the world had changed. If I think if we had pitched this book 10 years ago, I don't think it would have gone, I don't think anyone would have bit. On the heels of the TED Talk, on the heels of other books like uh, Atul Gawande's Being Mortal and Paul Kalanithi's book, When Breath Becomes Air, these had broken into modern popular consciousness outside of just clinical wonky stuff, like Kubler-Ross did in the 60s. This broke through and started mixing up the disciplines and getting into culture. So that led the way, that paved the way for a book like ours. So Simon Schuster bought it and away we went. That was thrilling to have a real big time publisher. The way it has been received, our guess was that it would be modestly well received, but for a long time because Mm -hmm. the subject wasn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And that seems like how it's going. It didn't take the world by storm. The subject still terrifies people. And we hear from people a lot who found their way to the book, loved it, but they're like, man, my mom sure could use this book, but I can't give her this book because of the title and she'll think she'll be terrified. So Mm. we still bump up against the sort of smoldering fear around the subject and the idea of people not wanting to look at it. The book is written very deliberately to help us look at this subject. So you have to be ready to look. And so that's been our challenge of how to push the book into the world and get it into the hands of people who actually need it has proven not easy, but it's been a work. And so I think that'll just keep going for years. We'll always be trying to find ways to get the book to people. Yeah. So it's been well-received, but not flying off the shelves either. Yeah, a book like that would have a, a glass ceiling, but also a lot of longevity potentially and a lot of impact. So I'd imagine yeah, a lot of people so. would probably write to you and say it was really helpful. This is wonderful. Yeah, brother. Thank you. And I have one final question Yeah. today. Alain de Botton, In his TED Talk, the philosopher Mm -hmm. talks about the difference Mm -hmm. between a lecture and a sermon. A lecture is a secular uh, way of giving you a little bit of information. And a sermon is an urgent plea trying to change your life in some Mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. I give you a couple minutes, the rest of the time that we have, to give a short sermon to someone. This one thing, what is the one thing that you would tell someone that would change their relationship with sickness, with death, with all this hard stuff that they will encounter later in life if they're not Mm -hmm. in in there now? Mm -hmm. Let's see here. I suppose the biggest point would be that includes all the others is that literally and metaphorically, if you can find a way to include death, uh, literal death or metaphorical death, like other losses, changes, things that outside your control. First of all, if you as a human being need to understand that the way you see the world, 
as it presents to you, it has to go through you to get to you. We are little prisms. We bend light. Mm -hmm. The reality of the world, as it's presented to us, we affect that. Beauty actually is in the eye of the beholder. Color is in the eye of the beholder, like literally. If you can grasp that and understand, therefore, that there are things going on outside of your control, understand that there are things going inside and outside of you, that life is flowing through you, it's not your life per se, it is. But life, big life, is being pushed through your body and your experiences, and it's one of an infinite variations on theme. And if you can find your way to craft a worldview that includes death, literal or metaphorical, then death is just another moment in life. Mm. The end of life is just the end of this life, your life, the end of, of BJ. But my body goes on, my emotions go on, the connections continue to affect people. If you believe in spirit, that certainly goes on. So I guess what I'm circling around here, Aaron, is this basic idea, find your way to a worldview that includes everything in you, every piece of you, including death. Mm. You will find your way to being at peace with yourself, to knowing yourself, to being fascinated by yourself, and being also able to let yourself go. You get all of the above if you can rope death into life. Hmm. That is not easy to do, but I'd highly suggest your effort will be well rewarded. And even if your whole concern is you're terrified of dying, I would still tell you that the surest way to protect yourself against a scary or awful death is to find a way to loving life and to living your life while you have it to live very important. It doesn't wait for you. Mm. So illness is not a detour. Death is not a d divergence. It is life, not its absence. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, such a pleasure. Thank you for your time today. <laughs> All right. That's it for today. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to support it, please consider writing a five-star review in Apple's podcast app or wherever you're listening. It helps many more people discover the podcast and also makes us feel good. Current support for the podcast comes from my own design company, Remake Labs. Uh, we run design sprints all over the world. Um, and our goal is to improve outcomes, whether in business or uh, various organizations through repeated and rapid design interventions. Now, until next time, be well, everyone. See you next week on Remake.